So uh, today's talk is sort of like a preview. We're doing a film screening tonight of a film called The Smell of Money. Uh, Jamie Berger is one of the writers and producers of the film. And um, she's originally from North Carolina, I think. And uh, it's all about, well, you'll see, but it's about the intersectionality of uh, hog farms and the impacts they cause both to local communities of color, uh, the environment, and obviously animals. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Jamie. Microphone working, can you hear me? Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me to attend Harvard Medical Law Week. This is such a privilege and a pleasure to speak with you all. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Jamie Berger. I'm the writer and producer of a feature length documentary called The Smell of Money. And as he said, that will be playing tonight, at least in this room. Yes. Uh, at 6 p.m., and I'm told there will be free pizza available, so I hope you all will come to that. Uh, this presentation will be kind of a preview of the film. I'll get into some detail about the, the topics of the film that I won't actually see in the movie, um, so hopefully you'll get a little bit of additional context, but again, I, I hope you'll be able to come out and actually watch it. Let me just see if I can move out of here. Okay, maybe that's working. I'll just click. Just tell me when you want to click. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, How's working out? It's great. We working? Okay. So, I, as Chris said, I was born and raised in North Carolina. And as you know, anything about the state, barbecue is, is big in North Carolina. It's the state's culinary claim to fame. Uh, like most North Carolinians, I grew up eating it, not thinking too much about that. Uh, it wasn't until high school when I took an environmental science class that I started learning about the harms of industrial animal agriculture. That really struck me, so I ended up kind of creating my entire college career, centering my college career around building myself up to be an activist and take down factory farming. Um, I spent a significant portion of my time at uh, when I was in college studying the pork industry specifically. I wrote my honor thesis on the pork industry impacts on people in my home state, on public health, on the environment, uh, also on workers and animals, so kind of taking a holistic look at that industry and history. And in some ways, I was most struck by this element of, excuse me, of environmental racism. Uh, that was something that I, you know, I had grown up about an hour and a half away from the where the stone takes place and you know, the region that I was studying, but the element of racism particularly was something that I hadn't been familiar with. So it was that experience that turned me into an activist. I ended up, uh, okay, that's okay. Uh, I ended up after college um, doing some lobbying work on Capitol Hill, and then I got uh, a job at the nonprofit organization Mercy for Animals. I'm sure some of you are familiar with them. Um, I started out doing communications, then moved into video production, then eventually became the chief of staff at MFA. Um, and at, at the time when I was doing video production, a colleague of mine, Sean Bannon, who became the uh, my co-producer on the film and the director of the film, came to me and said, I think we should do a future length documentary. And I had never worked on anything like that before. I was very excited by the prospect of it. And when we started tossing around different ideas to focus on and focus the film on, I immediately you know, thought of the issue of environmental justice and the pork industry in North Carolina because of my background in that. I knew it would be a really compelling story to tell. I also already knew a number of the folks who would end up becoming subjects of the film. And I knew that it was something that the animal movement that I was a part of had actually also quite you know, overlooked. Um, so that was about five years ago. We began filming, and I finally got able was able to kind of get into a factory farm, get into the area where factory farms are present in North Carolina. Um, and again, that was you know a bit down the road from where I lived, but kind of a whole new world for me. Um, it's been quite a journey. So we released the film about a year ago. We've been screening it at festivals since then and are starting to do more screenings like the one that we'll have tonight with universities, with law schools, with community organizations. And that's been 
the by far the best and most exciting part of this whole process. So I'm really grateful to you all for allowing me the opportunity to share the film and some of its messages with you. Okay, so to start off, I'd love to show the trailer. We can play. Oh, you can just hear the second time. Okay. So they are poisoning our soil, poisoning our groundwater, poisoning people, fellow Americans. They are stealing from them in the present and stealing from future generations. If it does not touch you in an emotional way, if you really get in to look at this issue, whether it's from an environmental standpoint, a, a, an animal rights issue, whether it's a human rights issue, whether it's an antibiotic use issue, if you can walk away from this saying, no big deal, you need to come talk to me. Come spend, let me take you for three days and let you sit down and talk to these people who have to live with this every day. Matter of fact, let me let you live in their shoes for a day and see if it doesn't change your mind. No, and ain't nobody helping us do nothing. They don't care because we black. We back up in the country. I just hope my house don't get burned up tonight from top of the year. I'm sure he's somewhere peeping now. You can believe that. He got his boys on you. What makes you think you have a right to set up a hog farm and destroy my way of life? People don't have access to clean air and clean water anymore. One of the most disturbing stories that I've heard is the sensation of being sprayed with shit, basically. I have seen this stream filled with feces and urine from this hog operation right up here more than one time. Almost every fish in the river died. Over a billion fish died in a period of about a week and a half. Every one of us on this road gotta help the fish. Every one of us, trust me. Our health is at stake here. To raise animals in this way puts all of us at risk. It is time that the village stand up, step up, and speak up. If these people had lived in McMansions, it would have been a different story. It's the power to control. That's what drives Van to the end of sanity. All the laws protect these industries. No one is protecting us. Okay. Um, so that's just a sneak peek of the film. Uh, I'd love to go ahead and introduce you to our main subject, our protagonist, Elsie Harry. Uh, she was born and raised on this land that you see in this photo in Duplin County, North Carolina. Her grandfather had purchased this land after he had been freed from slavery, he purchased it from his slave mistress, who was also his aunt. Uh, Elsie was raised here in this home with her 14 siblings and then went off to college in New York and pursued a career there. She came back to North Carolina in the 1980s to take care of her elderly mother. And one day about 30 years ago, Elsie and her mother were sitting on their front porch of the home you see and started to feel droplets pouring down on them. And they immediately knew that it wasn't rain because it had this overwhelming and just absolutely revolting odor. And it was animal waste that the farmer next door had begun spraying onto Elsie's mother's home. So the kind of insult to injury element of this is that the farmer had built his operation on land that he had stolen from Elsie's family. Uh, again, man that had been in her family since the times of slavery. And this set Elsie on a 30 year long fight for justice for the ability to breathe clean air and drink clean water and just live in a healthy, safe environment. Um, so she became a poster child for the fight for environmental justice, which I'll talk about more. 
And I'll come back to LC as well, but I want to just take a step back and kind of talk about what farming looks like in Eastern North Carolina. I'm sure this is just as absurd to you all that this is what comes up when you Google a farm today. Isn't it wild to think that this is still the image that we all have in our minds when we think about a farm, or most of us at least. Uh, this is what a farm looks like in North Carolina. This is a typical hog farm uh, in North Carolina. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's a typical hog farm in North Carolina. And to break this down a bit further, uh, these are what we call, as many of you I'm sure are familiar with this term, CAFOs or concentrated animal feeding operations. And the main components of that you'll see here, uh, there's the confinement buildings in which the animals are housed, the lagoon, which is the basically massive open air pit of not only feces and urine, but also, you know, um, chemicals, heavy metals, antibiotics are swept from underneath the buildings and pumped into this open pool. Uh, and then to the left, you can see a spray field. So when those lagoons fill up, they have to do something with the waste. And what they do in North Carolina is they pump the waste out over fields. They spray it over fields, essentially under the pretext of fertilizing crops. But this is really just a cheap way of getting rid of the waste. Uh, you can see here, this is a typical sprayer. It kind of looks like a gigantic industrial scale sprinkler and it shoots the waste. Oh, apologies. <laughs> Clicking it. So. Um, it shoots the waste out over the fields and you can see it also turns it into this fine uh, mist. So <clears throat> it's kind of difficult to describe just how much waste is produced in North Carolina. Um, it's in an absolutely enormous volume. Just two of these facilities, two capos can produce as much as a city of about half a million people. And I like to share this quote from a major newspaper in North Carolina. They said, imagine a city as big as New York suddenly grafted onto North Carolina's coastal plain. Double it in size. Now imagine that this city has no sewage treatment plants. All of the waste from 5 million people is simply flushed into open pits and sprayed onto fields. Turn those humans into hogs and you don't have to imagine it's already here. So when I went up in a plane over eastern North Carolina, this is what I saw. And if you were to fly a drone over that part of the state, you'd see the same thing. Uh, just these facilities scattered all across the landscape in the eastern part of the state. And because they're in that region of North Carolina, they're in the state's coastal floodplain, which is prone, of course, to flooding and hurricanes which happen frequently in North Carolina and are becoming even more frequent and even more powerful due to climate change. This is the aftermath of a hurricane in the 1990s that inundated farms and caused massive lagoon spills. Uh, something that I think is interesting about the aftermath of this is that because there was some negative media attention and images like this popped up after that hurricane, the industry now tells the farmers to just close the doors, keep the animals trapped inside so that they drown and are no longer uh, uh, provide this kind of visual to the media. So this is, you can see the kind of pinkish brown feces from the lagoon completely spilling out of the pits, uh, running through floodwaters, of course, you know, straight into rivers and streams, and then eventually to the ocean. This is a satellite image from Hurricane Florence in 2018, uh, which broke all flooding records in North Carolina and resulted in a complete spillover of about 50 hog lagoons. As you can imagine, this pollution can lead to massive fish kills, like this one in North Carolina's Noose River, uh, where over a billion fish died in a matter of just a couple of days. But this isn't just a problem, of course, during hurricane season. Many studies show that waste from lagoons um, makes its way into streams and rivers on a regular basis and even can be can travel several miles downwind because it's, again, sprayed into the air. Um, and 
what my documentary largely focuses on is the impact that this has on people, that the fact that the waste often does land directly on people's homes and their property. Uh, and I want to note that this practice, the lagoon and spray field system, is standard practice in North Carolina, and it's completely legal and largely unregulated, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. So just to give you a sense of the density, the concentration of these facilities, um, you can take a look at this map. The red dots represent hog capos, and the purple represent poultry capos. Uh, these two counties that are almost completely covered, Sampson and Duplin County, have the highest concentration of industrial animal facilities anywhere in the country and likely in the world. This is just a closer view of those two counties. The problem here, of course, is that this part of the state relative to other rural areas is actually relatively highly populated. So situations like this one are extremely common where you see capos located very, in very close proximity to people's homes. And because factory farms are essentially on top of people who live there, uh, the poop, the waste from these farms quite literally lands on and gets inside their homes. So in one study, 82% of homes near capos tested positive for hog fecal bacteria that they actually were able to do to a kind of biomarker trace back to the facilities nearby. So how does this actually affect people who live here? As you can imagine, it has terrible effects on human health. Um, the, the mortality rate graph that you see is from a Duke University study that compares North Carolina communities uh, near hog capos and the North Carolina average and the US average, you can see the stark difference there. And they controlled you know, for other variables in the study, like poverty, for example. Uh, so folks in these regions experience higher rates of infections, kidney disease, different types of cancer, anemia, asthma, and a host of other respiratory issues, uh, higher infant mortality rates. And this also has an impact on people's mental health. Um, so higher rates of anxiety and depression. There's also evidence of decreased property values and just other general quality of life issues. Uh, and I can say from having spent a lot of time in Eastern North Carolina, you, you know, this might not be surprising, but the odor itself is one of the main factors that people often cite as being something that just has an extremely harmful impact on their life. Uh, it's interesting because if you're spending time out there and the smell comes by, it doesn't just sort of waft in and out. It sort of has this heaviness to it. It kind of hangs in the air. And I would notice that it would be embedded in my clothes, in my hair. It would take several washes and showers to fully rid myself of the smell after I spent time there. And I like to tell this, this anecdote about a researcher who went to North Carolina to study pollution from hog capos. And he went home, and after months, he was still smelling it. And of course, he had washed everything and didn't know why the smell was still lingering. And it turns out that it had embedded itself in his eyeglasses. So that just gives you a sense of how potent, how powerful the odor really is. And you can imagine it's, it's pretty horrific to live with that every day. Um, there's also flies, there's buzzards, you know, there's other nuisances like that that people report. There's truck noise from the trucks picking up pigs and taking them out, um, going back and forth at all hours of the day and night. So there's a, there's a host of problems associated with this. And there's one other element that we don't necessarily see come through in studies, but that I think is important to mention which is the level of kind of fear that's present in many of these communities and the harassment and challenges that they face as a result of pressure and kind of surveillance from the oil industry. So I'll show another clip. We might have somebody knock on the door nighttime or somebody key my car, somebody key my husband's truck. You might find a gas tank open in the morning time, something like that. Or you might hear a, in the bathroom, boom. That's why we keep that cardboard to when the, so they don't know where I'm sitting at. It look a little tacky, but 
keep me safe. Cause they shoot in the house, they don't know where I'm at. I just hope my house don't get burned up tonight from talking to you. <laughs> he's cause I'm sure he's somewhere peeping now. You he's, can believe yeah, that. He got his boys on you. He's somewhere he peeping. He called him and told him you walked over here, you came over here. They already been riding by. He ain't supposed to be talking to us. Mm. A lot of different things going on in this rural area, so we're just checking, make sure everybody's legitimate. So that was, so how is this, how is this an example of environmental racism? You probably noticed the Confederate flag in that last clip where you need to this question. Um, you know, there's a reason why we don't see this in Eastern North Carolina, where we don't see big McMansions in this region. It's not a coincidence that factory farms are located largely in poor black and brown neighborhoods. It's very much a product of the history of slavery in the South and ongoing, you know, current systemic racism and classism at play in North Carolina. So researchers from the University of North Carolina looked at historical slave populations in the state and then compared that to the geographical pattern of industrial animal operations, hog operations in particular. So the dark red areas you see in this map indicate the highest population of enslaved people. The black dots are factory farms, and you can see there's a, quite a clear overlap there. And the researchers who made this map, I, I really appreciate what they, how they kind of put it into context. They said, industrial hog operations are disproportionately located in areas with high populations of poor Blacks who have been, been disenfranchised in a system that began during slavery and continues today in the form of racially segregated schools, housing, and job opportunities. And they go on to say, the pork industry actually chose these locations because of the lack of local political power and the acceptability in the dominant society of sacrificing poor Blacks, their communities, and the value of their crop. So I think this, that, that, that quote really sums up this issue in a nice way. This is considered to be a textbook piece of environmental racism. And the environmental justice movement actually was born in North Carolina. So this it's been a battleground state for issues like that for decades. And it's not just capos. We actually saw when we were out there that many other polluting industries locate in the same region. So there's a, a Gen X or Chemours plant, if you're familiar with that, like the Teflon pollutants um, is out there. There's a wood pellet factory, there's landfills. We have one of our subjects, and you'll we'll, we'll see this in the film, she said, whatever white people don't want, come to Eastern North Carolina and we'll show it to you because it's here. So how did this come to be? This graph shows how small farms in North Carolina were replaced by big industrial farms. And there are a lot of factors at play in this, uh, in this you know, um, trend. The green line you see here is the number of farms and the red is the number of hogs. So over, and over time, fewer and fewer farms were raising more and more animals. And this growth of industrial farming largely happened, of course, in, again, black and brown and poor communities. And that happened in large part thanks to, due to this man, whose name is Wendell Murphy. He was a small scale pig farmer in North Carolina, and he observed what was happening with the poultry industry. He saw John Python and Bo Pilgrim and Frank Perdue uh, taking their kind of this concept of the contract farming system, applying it to poultry, and they put a million independent chicken farmers out of business and made themselves very wealthy. And he said, I can do the same thing with pigs. So Wendell Murphy grew to become the country's largest uh, pork company CEO. His company, Murphy Brown, was later purchased by Smithfield Foods, which is now the world's largest pork company. Um, and he made himself very well. He became a billionaire. But the thing about Wendell Murphy was that he was also a state representative. He was a member of the North Carolina State House. And then he was a state senator after that. 
So, and this was at the same time that he was becoming, you know, uh, a wealthy kind of hog, um, hog industry CEO. So he, while he was, you know, working in office, he championed a series of laws that cleared the way for the industry's explosion in North Carolina. That included, you know, tax breaks, protections, and exemptions from zoning laws. Uh, he created an early version of a right to farm law. This, all of this occurred in the 1990s. Um, he had capos categorized in the same way in, in the eyes of the law as uh, small family farms. And he also exempted capos from pretty much every environmental standard. Um, he was later exposed for, not surprisingly, illegal campaign contributions and other kind of nefarious things. Um, you know, as as a, a business owner and as a as a senator. In contrast to Wendell Murphy's story, I want to share another story of a legislator in North Carolina. This is Cindy Watson. She was elected to the North Carolina House, uh, representing Cleveland County, but here we go. Many capos in 1995, and she was a Republican. She was determined to be, in her words, a darling of big business. Um, but soon after she was elected, she started receiving comments and complaints from her own constituents about the impacts of the pork industry, including from Elsie Herring. She actually went out to Elsie's home and she went out to visit with other members of the group that had formed to address the harm of industrial hog operations. And she was completely transformed by that experience, by her ability to see with her own eyes what was happening on the ground to the people that she had been elected to represent. So she went back to her job. She went back to the North Carolina State House and ended up successfully passing a moratorium on the construction of new hog farms in the state. <clears throat> but this came at a incredible cost to her personally and politically. She began, as soon as she started speaking out against the industry, she began to be harassed and threatened. She received a note saying that her body would be found at the bottom of a river. Um, and she was, she was terrified. She was really traumatized by that. And then the industry uh, poured tens of thousands of dollars into a really aggressive and negative ad campaign against her and also bankrolled her challenger in the 1998 Republican primary in the state. So she, of course, lost that race and never ran for office again. She had been so traumatized by that experience that she changed career paths entirely. Um, and I think this just goes to show that the industry made an example out of her. They said, if you dare to challenge us, if you stand up against us, this will happen to you. We will do this to you. And I think that explains why so little has actually changed in North Carolina in the last 30 years, because I think a bunch of other legislators saw this happen and they see it happen today in the form of, you know, continuing campaign contributions and negative ad campaigns and they'll really, you know, challenge anyone who, who dares to speak out. There was one other kind of element at play that encouraged the passage of that moratorium that I mentioned. And this is a story I like to tell that I think highlights some of the systemic issues uh, at play at the time and still currently. So as factory farms were exploding across North Carolina, one was eventually planned to be built near a very wealthy white community. Um, and a golf resort, this place. And of course, those folks had political power. They said, we don't want this in our backyard. And it was their push after decades of this industry's growth, or at least a decade or so of this industry's growth. It was finally those people's push to their elected officials that really made the moratorium permanent. Um, and I think this, again, this anecdote highlights racism and, and classism as really defining factors in this story. So now I just want to introduce you to a couple more of the subjects of our film. This is Willie Jr. and Maury. Uh, their family has been on the land that you see here since the Civil War. Willie has asthma and has to use a breathing machine. He, they both told us that they often can't play outside because the smell is so overwhelming. Um, we heard stories from other children that they endure teasing on the bus because they smell like poop. 
Um, and that they at times had to even run off of the bus to throw up because the smell of, as they're passing by the CAFO was just so horrifically overwhelming. Uh, this is Renee Miller, who is those boys' uh, great great aunt. She also has respiratory issues. She had, as, as I mentioned before, kind of waste sprayed directly on her property and her home on a near daily basis. And I think it's important to remember that people like Renee, again, have been on this land for generations. One of the things that we often hear the industry say is, oh, well, they just moved in. You know, they moved in after the farms were there and they started complaining. And that's just truly, you know, not the case. So to bring it back to Elsie, I just also want to make clear that she and her fellow community members were not just kind of victims in these circumstances, they were very active and fierce organizers fighting the industry. So she led a decades-long fight, as I said, for justice. She worked with legislators, she held protests and vigils, she spoke at conferences. She became a spokesperson for the media. So if you Google her, you'll find that she's mentioned in probably thousands of articles speaking out against this. She uh, brought her concerns to city and town council meetings, and she even testified in front of the US Congress. <clears throat> Most recently, Elsie and about uh, 500 other community members sued Smithfield Foods, the world's largest pork company. And that brought about this nine year long legal battle against that company, um, which you can learn more about if you come see the film. I'm not gonna give any spoilers away, the legal drama in my documentary, um, but it's, it's a really interesting fight and, and a compelling and, and I think inspiring story of their, their fight in the court. Um, so I know I've thrown a lot of facts at you today, but I hope you'll come see the film because this is really about the people. The film is really about the kind of human side of this story, about the people who have experienced this and have been fighting it for, for so long. Um, I hope you'll you know, come hear their voices for yourself and hopefully learn from them and be inspired. So again, that's tonight in this room, 6 p.m. And even if you're not able to come, do want to thank you all again for participating in this talk. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you want to keep in touch and you want to follow the film and see it at another time. Uh, you can find our information at uh, smellonlight.com or on social media. So thank you all. So thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question, and I will bring the microphone to you so the people can remotely can hear. Hi, Elsie. Hi, Renee. Hi, Renee. Hey, thank you so much for the presentation. And I, I kind of like have two questions. The first one is. Um, I think this story must be or should be heard by as many people as possible. So, what are your distribution plans, or if any big uh, stream company is interested in this documentary that again I repeat should be seen and heard by as many people as possible in the world? And the second question is like, uh, if, if was it hard to convince the subjects? of the film to participate in your project and if it was hard to gain the the community trust yeah thank you those are both great questions uh as far as distribution we're working on it it's a really difficult time to be part of documentary right now there's a lot of the turmoil in the streaming industry um, we're hearing even from filmmakers who have won awards at Sundance, they can't get their films sold, so it's very challenging. So, no one's ready that works. Yeah. Um, but we're we're hopeful. We're still optimistic. We haven't gotten any no's from anyone yet. Um, and for the meantime, like I said, we're just doing everything we can to put the film into the hands of people who are doing this kind of activism every day. So. We're offering it for free to anyone, basically anyone who wants to do a screening. 
Um, so we've done a lot of work so far with grassroots organizations and, and you know, uh, to national nonprofits who, who have screened it to, you know, audiences to try to kind of build their own movements and achieve their own goals. So that's a big, you know, way we're distri distributing it ourselves for now, but we still have hope that we'll be able to get it onto the streaming platform eventually. Um, I love your second question. Yes, it was incredibly difficult for us to build trust with the community. I mean, I'm white, my uh, co-producer is white, so I think the race element was huge for us. There was a barrier there for us to overcome. And, you know, we made mistakes. I think it's important to be honest to say, we kind of, oh, oh, okay. At times we, you know, kind of, I don't think struck the perfect balance between wanting to get the shots that we wanted or the interviews that we wanted and respecting the community's needs and and you know um kind of creating the film on their timeline rather than ours but that's a lesson i would say we learned pretty early on and that's part of why it took us four years to create the film that we really had we really had to reckon with the fact that you know these are people who are dealing with all different kinds of struggles not just the ones that we you know want to present in the film and it's it's easy to fall into the pattern of kind of extractive, you know, filmmaking or, or journalism. And I heard from many of the community members, you know, that they would just have journalists kind of plop in and get their story and leave. And so we were very intentional about not doing it that way. We wanted to take our time, move slowly, move at their pace, allow them to dictate, you know, even how the story was told. Um, and that took, that took a long time, but that's, you know, that's how earning trust can go sometimes. Um, we also showed the film to our subjects and had them give us feedback on it to make sure that we were accurately presenting their stories. Um, we tried to kind of find other ways to actually actively partner with different organizations working on the ground on this issue. You know, so we offered various resources to them, videos to them as we were going about this process. But we definitely, I mean, we have so many people, countless people just outright say that they wouldn't talk to us, let alone go on camera. And I think that again speaks to that whole level of kind of fear of retaliation. Um, we have people say, oh, you know, my my cousin's wife works in the industry. And so if I say anything, they're gonna come after me, you know, or they're gonna come after my cousin or whatever. So there's there were a lot of family ties that we had to navigate too and be really sensitive to that. That if people speak out, that could be, you know, the end of their livelihood. Um, so yes, building trust was a long. A long process. I think we had to reckon with our own racism, with our own kind of goals as filmmakers, and and reprioritize and put those below uh, the needs of the community. And again, I don't think we did that perfectly, but it was something that we tried as hard as we could to be intentional about. Hi, uh, Jamie. Thank you. Um, so I have a follow up question. So a question related to what Carlos was saying, but I also have an question about uh, the cause of action because it seems so clearly a nuisance truly and so I don't want to spoil the legal drama um, but I'd like to know um, if you have uh, any thoughts on the cause of action um, specifically with the nuisance um, argument and then the next one would be how was how would you say your race um, factored into your uh, interactions with a police officer, the sheriff, for instance, because I believe if I were in that car, he would have been way more aggressive uh, with me. And so, but, you know, seeing that racism and seeing how we can use that, their ignorance for um, justice. And so I just would like to know more about your experience with regard to that. That is a question I always was, wish everyone would ask me, and I try to work it into my Q and A's if I can, or even my presentation. So thank you for asking that. Um, I'll start with your first question, but can you explain what cause of action is? Because y'all are the lawyers. That's not me. <laughs> um, your your cause for complaint. So the nuisance being the smell. It's it's interrupting their uh, sort of quiet enjoyment of their home, their land. Yeah. Eat their health. Yeah. How is that permissible? It, Corruption, obviously, but yeah, I would just like to know, you know, not to spoil the legal drama, but if you could give us in, in, information about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. I think um, 
it's it's so clearly a nuisance. And you know, I think it's okay to give away like juries, juries, just average people agreed with that. Um, but I think the trouble in actually getting to the point of taking on the industry legally, you know, through uh, through a lawsuit was just that its power is so immense that no lawyers were willing to actually take that case on until until it reached the woman who ultimately did. Her name is Mona Lisa Wallace, and you meet her more in the film. Um, but I think she she had an instance where she was representing a, a widow of a man who worked at a, at a Smithfield slaughter plant, I believe, and he fell into a, like a holding tank for waste and died. And so she was, you know, suing the company on her behalf. I guess you probably know the right terms for this, but you know, wrongful death or something like that, maybe. Um, and I think she was just so struck by that. So she had, you know, research the impacts of waste on on people's health through that case, and she was so appalled that she was like, "I don't care if this is the biggest battle I'm ever going to fight." I'm going to take it on. And so her, her firm, it was a relatively small firm in North Carolina, ended up pouring millions and millions of dollars into the case. And of course, they were up against like this, this global behemoth that did everything they, can, they could to prolong it and drain them and stalk them and harass them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you're so right. Like, if you look at this on the surface, it's so clear. And I think that just goes to show that there's always, at least in cases like these, so many other political, cultural, you know, factors that play. There's all, all these things that happen with the media around the case. And I think one of the more interesting things um, about it was that in the middle of the ongoing lawsuit, the North Carolina legislature attempted to pass a bill that would have stopped it, which is, as far as I have heard, unprecedented for, uh, for you know, the North Carolina General Assembly to intervene and try to end an ongoing lawsuit in the middle um, is, is just wild. And they almost did that. They were almost successful, but what they, they, they had that piece of the bill stripped. But what they were able to pass, actually, was legislation that prevents this kind of nuisance case from ever happening again. So no one else now has the ability to sue um, for nuisance, you know, sue a, a cog operation or a cog company. Um, and, you know, that was challenged, the constitutionality of, of that was challenged, that challenge didn't go anywhere. So it's, a, it's an ongoing fight. Um, to your second question, yeah, I mean, my race was an, an enormous factor, I think, in my ability to make this film, to feel even relatively comfortable in this area, to know that if I were going to be stopped and pulled over by the police, that I would probably be okay. And I think my gender also, the fact that I'm a woman, you know, plays something into that. And I'm like, who oh, is this innocent so white lady out here, you know? Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> um, but you're right. I mean, we, we reflect on this all the time that if any of our subjects or other residents had been even in the car with us, if they had been in the driver's seat, it would have been a completely different story. And I think it's important to talk about that and talk about, you know, I think my race was kind of a double-edged sport in this. As I said, it was a barrier to building trust in the community, but it also gave me a certain level of protection to be able to do this kind of work in Eastern North Carolina. I think, you know, there's always a big risk in trying to tell a story through film that is not your own, that doesn't come from the community that you come from. Um, you know, I'm from North Carolina, like I said, but the world I grew up in is completely different. I came from a well as relatively wealthy white area of the state. Um, so, you know, I wanted to use my privilege for good, but I think it also, was difficult for me to, you know, reckon with, again, like I said, my own racism to be able to learn, you know, how to step back, how to let the community lead, how to let our subjects really tell their own stories in their own way. And like I said, I don't think I did that perfectly. I think I've learned a lot. And I think, you know, the thing that makes me kind of most grateful is seeing now community members' reactions to the film and how they have appreciated it and how they're now using it as a tool, you know, for their own 
work and it really hasn't been embraced by the community in eastern north carolina and other communities dealing with environmental justice issues so i hope that goes to show you know that i you know we we at least did in the end kind of earn their trust and, and give them something that they felt proud of and felt that they were a part of it's time for one more question here i'll just add in california when they pass a vlog rob and Part of that agreement was to kill existing litigation that was going on. It was moving forward pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of back and forth within the community, whether that was in the you know, decided to take that deal, but it was still frustrating for the folks who were pursuing the lawsuit. Thank you so much for speaking about this film. I'm really looking forward to seeing it this evening. I just wanted to ask a very simple question about the title of the documentary, how you titled it. Yeah. Uh, we had heard this phrase come up a couple of times as we were out in North Carolina that the smell of waste in the air that you undoubtedly will encounter when you're out there is just the smell of money. Um, and that actually we ended up being able to trace it back to Wendell Murphy, the man who I, you know, told you the story about that he, anytime anybody would complain whether, you know, farmers were getting into the business or residents in the area complain about the smell, you say, Oh, that's just the smell of money. You know, we just kind of write it off. Um, and we've been tossing around ideas for the title of the film, and it was actually that lawyer, Mona Lisa Wallace, who said to us, you know, I think you should call it the smell of money. <laughs> and I had thought of it before, but it didn't really like ring right in my ears until she said it. And I was like, I think that is the right call for it. So yeah, there's a bit more context to the film about that. And um, but yeah, I think it was important for us to get kind of the two elements, the sting and the, you know, capitalism basically into the title. Very cool. Thanks. I've got one question just briefly from the viewer online saying, um, where can she find the film after today? What do you suggest? Yeah, so as I mentioned, learned, the film isn't available to stream online yet, unfortunately. Um, but like I said, we're doing screenings all across the country, actually in the world, we just had screening request from Finland. So we're taking it as far as we can. Um, if you want us to request a screening, if you want to host a screening, you know, at your community group or, or uh, university, you can go to our website and there's a form to fill out to request a screening. Um, but, and you can, you know, stay updated with us, follow us along the see when we'll be able to have it more widely accessible to, to everyone online. Wonderful. Please join me again. Thank you, Jay Berger, for coming to the